In today's video, let's review the data about a tool that can support your metabolic health. This tool is known as berberine hydrochloride. It actually has a large and long dossier of human clinical research, and we're going to review that right now. This was one of the most, I think, detailed reviews about how berberine can improve various aspects of metabolic health, from fatty liver disease to polycystic ovarian syndrome to dysglycemia, poor blood sugar handling, and beyond. Uh, this was an excellent recently published summary of all of the human clinical data. They do include some of the animal model data, which I'm going to completely ignore because I don't want to recommend something that just has animal model studies. I want to uh, focus on what is berberine hydrochloride. So this is actually derived from the Berberus aristata plant. And this is something you should really know about. There's a lot of synthetic berberines on the marketplace uh, that are made from petrochemicals, uh, a lot of the uh, Chinese source material is, is, has been uh, tested via carbon-14 data, and it's, it's not Berberus aristata. It's not derived from wild-crafted berberine found in the Himalayas. So there's only one company that's doing that. I'll share with you momentarily about that. But berberine is a polyphenolic structural compound, and it's actually really poorly absorbed. And that's the magic of berberine. It seems to impact both diversity of the microbiota, the gut bacteria that reside in your small and large intestine, and it also improves the release of incretin or gut hormones. And these have been recently popularized with the uh, push for semiglutide and ozempic and so forth, all the so-called incretin hormones. Uh, these are peptides that your gut makes when you start eating food, but as you get more metabolically unhealthy, you start to gain more body fat, your small intestine starts to release less of these hormones and therefore you have more post-meal processing disorders, i.e. hyperinsulinemia, high triglycerides, high blood glucose, polycystic ovarian syndrome, fatty liver disease, and so forth. And so um, it turns out that berberine is like nature's way of improving and optimizing these gut hormones. Now, if we didn't have 93.6% of US adults having some degree of metabolic dysfunction, we probably wouldn't need to recommend berberine. But, you know, only one in 10 US adults has optimal metabolic health. Most people have some degree of poor metabolic health. And so what I like about berberine is there's tons of data on this and you can actually feel and notice the results. The first time I started to use berberine, not for metabolic health, but to increase my ketone levels, I noticed a significant drop in my blood sugar and a significant concomitant rise in blood ketones because I was really into testing my ketones in 2015, 2016. I started to think about this Myoscience brand and what formulas we're going to come out with. And I was like, we have to find a really high quality berberine. And we did secure that from the Himmerberg folks over in the Himalayas, which I'll just put links in the description below. I'm not going to talk about the product. If you want to you know, look at a carbon-14 verified wild-crafted hand harvested berberus aristata pure berberine hydrochloride product it'll be in the description below that's where we're going to go here because we're going to talk about conditions that are actually very serious like atherosclerosis and, and, and other things so i just want to uh, let you know that that is an option here but i want you to know that berberine has pleiotropic effects and so here's figure two mechanisms related to how berberine functions in the body and this is largely derived from animal model studies and tissue culture studies. So I'm not gonna lean on this too much, but what I like about natural compounds and even metformin, it's derived from the French lilac, which is a plant. Natural compounds tend to have pleiotropic effects. In contrast, pharmacologic compounds, you know, an SSRI, for example, other, other things that might lower your blood pressure, they're very specific to a one particular target or inhibiting an enzyme. If we think about statins, now I know statins exist in nature and so forth from red yeast rice, and there's multiple statin compounds, but it seems that berberine has these pleiotropic effects, which is also exciting because most of these pleiotropic effects are positive, uh, affecting mitochondrial function, affecting glucose metabolism, insulin response, and cretin hormone release, and so forth. So here are all the mechanisms about how berberine might affect metabolic health. So now I do want to talk about dihydroberberine. I'm not a big fan of this because berberine has this inside out control. I know theoretically it's better absorbed, but there is this level of, there's not a lot of free berberine in the blood after taking dihydroberberine. And as you will see in this data set, there is not a, no human data up to now, we're filming this in early November of 2025, no human data on dihydroberberine. It's all on berberine HCL. So why would, why would we recommend a product that has literally no research on it because it's theoretically better absorbed? Imagine if someone came to you and said, hey, 
you know, we know all the beneficial effects of metformin. Well, what if we can get metformin better absorbed? Would you want that? I don't know. Would you? Would, would that mean that it, it's, it would have better clinical outcomes? I'm not so sure because we're ignoring the effect of these compounds and how they impact the gut bacteria and the gut hormones. So if we bypass all that, we might bypass some of the therapeutic benefits. So we don't always need to optimize absorption. You know, if we're talking about vitamin B12 or we're talking about creatine, creatine works within the muscles, right? We want creatine to be absorbed. If we want vitamin B12, it works in your liver and your brain and so forth. Um, you have supporting methylation, right? So you want that to get into your liver, right? Because that's where most methylation reactions occur. But in the context of berberine and, and metformin, it seems that most of the mechanisms of action occur in the gut. So chasing absorption with liposomes and all this stuff uh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense uh, to me. So I, I, I don't think that berberine hydrochloride is all that exciting. Now, let's look at the summary of human clinical trials based on their effect in the body, lowering cholesterol in humans. So this is a summary of eight or more human clinical trials dating back to 2012 all the way up to 2022. So in 365 diabetic individuals, berberine decreased uh, total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. Um, I'm not so concerned about total cholesterol or LDL cholesterol. I'm actually more concerned uh, about triglyceride reduction. I get more excited about this. So this was uh, a 2016 study in individuals with mild hyperlipidemia just 300 milligrams of berberine lowered triglycerides. Uh, 1,200 milligrams of berberine in three divided doses also lowered triglycerides in women with PCOS and so forth. So low dose, it, between 300 and 500 milligrams per day seems to affect blood lipids, which I think is quite interesting. What about blood pressure? We're looking at table three here. So six clinical trials or, or studies uh, that have looked at how berberine affects blood pressure in individuals who have hypertension. Uh, you see significant shifts in both systolic and diastolic blood pressure at low dosages, ranging, ranging from 300 milligrams up to 500 milligrams three times a day. So most studies for berberine vary from 500 milligrams up to 1500 milligrams per day. Most people do not need more than that. All of these six studies show that berberine lowers blood pressure. So we have a lowering of triglycerides. As I mentioned, eight studies there, uh, six studies finding lowering of blood pressure. Now, what's interesting is we have animal model studies on glycemic parameters, and then we have human studies. We have one, two, three, four, five. We have over 10 human studies finding that berberine improves blood sugar metabolism in humans decreasing fasting glucose, decreasing two-hour oral glucose tolerance, decreasing hemoglobin A1C, fasting glucose, as well as liver fat in women with PCOS and NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So really good data to show in humans, these studies are not super old, some are really, really new, you know, several in 2021, several in 2020 and 2023. Uh, the earliest study that was cited here in this summary was 2010. Okay, what about fatty liver disease? We have more than six studies finding that berberine helps improve lipid profiles and or liver enzymes and also ultrasound studies that show that berberine reduces liver fat content as well as your three liver function tests. So if you downloaded our blood work cheat sheet over at highintensityhealth.com, you know this. You have your ALT, AST, and GGT. Uh, studies show that when those liver function tests go over 30 units per liter, that's problematic for you know the future and prognosis of your liver as well as cardiovascular health. Berberine improves liver enzymes by supporting metabolic health. So I think that's important. All these uh, studies show, and some use ultrasound, some use MRI and so forth. And these are not small studies, 180 individuals with fatty liver disease, 68 individuals with fatty liver disease. So decent number of subjects, in these studies find berberine at higher dosages here some of these studies lasted as long as 16 weeks or 18 weeks one or two grams per day the highest dose was six grams per day i wouldn't recommend that that would probably cause some gastrointestinal distress in people so i think less is more for most folks honestly when it comes to berberine 
Now, let's talk about bourbon and cancer. This is really interesting. We have five clinical studies in individuals with colorectal cancer, uh, cervical cancer, and other types of cancer finding that low doses of berberine, 300 milligrams to 600 milligrams per day, uh, actually had a decreased recurrence rate of colorectal adenomas. And also they looked at lymphomas and cervical cancer improvements in those different uh, aforementioned cancers. So again, this is a natural co product, a natural compound. And it kind of makes sense that berberine might improve the prognosis of someone diagnosed with cancer because we know that metabolic health and cancer are intimately connected and impossible to disentangle. So uh, that to me makes a lot of sense. I think this is um, important. Now, what about the risks, uh, particularly the drug-drug interactions with berberine? I think this is important. There might be effects um, linked with uh, tamoxifen. So for individuals who are on Novodex for say breast cancer or something, uh, Cipro, there tends to be uh, uh, potential for antibiotic dose reduction. So if you're taking Cipro for an infection, um, metformin, there seems to be conflicting effects with metformin, cyclosporin, warfarin, uh, and possibly ketoconazole. So those are things that people should consider. We're talking about table eight here uh, as well. So here's the thing I think is, is important for folks to understand is that berberine is well known to have low intestinal absorption and poor bioavailability, but obviously it has clinical effects. And so how does it work? It works within the gut, improving diversity, improving the gut hormones and so forth. So I think that's something that we should definitely, uh, consider, and it might even improve the, uh, intestinal tight junctions and, and help with, uh, intestinal uh, permeability. So I think that's something that should be considered. But overall, in this review, the investigators say, berberine shows a promise for low toxicity and is a potential therapeutic agent for improving cardiovascular health by enhancing lipid profiles, reducing inflammation, and promoting endothelial function despite bioavailability challenges. Again, when it comes to these herbs, we don't always want to optimize bioavailability because most of these herbs actually work in the gut. So I think that's important. It's therapeutic effects on atherosclerosis and ischemic heart disease, lipid profiles, lowering blood pressure and enhancing glycemic control offer a promising alternative to conventional treatments with fewer side effects, highlighting the value of incorporating natural supplements like berberine into lifestyle changes for better health outcomes and chronic conditions. Its multifaceted effects make it a valuable adjunct in managing non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, especially amid rising obesity and type two diabetes. They even go on to say the research underscores the promising role of berberine as a potential anti-cancer agent, revealing its capabilities in modulating a range of cellular mechanisms critical to tumor growth and metastasis. Berberine has been shown to influence various pathways involved in cell proliferation, apoptosis, and angiogenesis, which are fundamental processes in cancer development and progression. So I think this uh, you know, suggests that there are promising findings with regards to berberine as a natural compound that can help support metabolic health. I would encourage you to try this. You know, most studies find and advise people to take berberine 30 minutes before major meals. So this could be lunchtime, this could be dinner time. starting on the low end of 300 milligrams up to say 750 milligrams once or twice per day. I found anecdotally this works as a natural appetite suppressant. So this can be effective this time of year around the holiday seasons. You, you know, when you go to these dinner parties and holiday parties, when there's more food availability, you tend to eat more. And if you're prone to trying and sampling everything, you know, you have 2000 calories, you know, you're like, I didn't exercise today. That can be a problem. And that over time can lead to weight gain. So if you're like me and you like to taste everything and overeat, when you're in a big group, you might want to try berberine. I would just take 500 to 750 milligrams before you go to a party and see what you might notice with regards to your cravings. I found it helps with the alcohol cravings as well as food cravings. So I would like to know what your thoughts are. Let me know in the comments section below for products and reviews. I'll put those in the description below. And I'll also put this article in the description below as well. I'm grateful that you tuned in to the very end. Let me know what you think, and we'll catch you on a future video down the road.